Order, order. I call Matt Chorley. And Patrick Maguire, of course. Patrick Maguire sitting in for Tim Shipman uh, for PMQ's Unpacked. We sort of slightly forgotten about Boris Johnson and all of this, but he's, he's not had a great few days, really, is he? We were at the beginning of the week. We were we played out a whole load of off the record comments from MPs and ministers, and it was pretty grim listening for Number Ten. Yeah, and somebody ought to you know check overnight that the government hasn't secretly released the results of that leak inquiry uh, into who uh, who briefed uh, the Times and other newspapers the uh, the lockdown before it happened. Yeah, it's been it's been. You know, he's in the position this Wednesday that he sw swore he would never be in, i.e. Uh, pressing the nuclear button that is a second national lockdown. Uh, but looking through the the list of uh, of MPs who are going to be uh, questioning the Prime Minister, obviously we'll bring you Keir Starmer when he's up in the House of Commons. Uh, there's also the Tory MPs, Andrew Jones, Nick Fletcher, Stuart Anderson, Nazgani, Mark Pawsey, Sajid Javid, the former Home Secretary, Natalie Alphick. Are any of those likely to cause the Prime Minister trouble? Uh, Nick Fletcher and Stuart Anderson are both members of the 2019 intake. And if I, if I am not mistaken, uh, they are both uh, in sort of uh, northern Red Wally sort of seats. So they could have uh, a couple of sharp words with the Prime Minister. OK, well, we wait uh, for the signal that Keir Starmer is up in the House of Commons today. I mean, it should be, in normal times, this would be quite a big week, wouldn't it? You know, you've got um, Keir Starmer still dealing with the fallout of anti-Semitism with the Labour Party. The suspension of Jeremy Corbyn uh, as a Labour MP uh, following that report from the Equality and Human Rights Commission. Uh, and then, you, like I said, uh, you've got Boris Johnson in, in uh, trouble with his own side over this lockdown in England. Uh, let's go to the House of Commons now. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Can I start with the elections in the United States? Whatever the results, will the Prime Minister join me in saying that it's not for a candidate to decide which votes do and don't count or when to stop counting? The next President must be the free and fair choice of the American people. Can I also express my revulsion at the terrorist attacks in Nice and Vienna? Um, I'm sure I speak for the whole House in saying our thoughts are with all of those affected. And of course, Mr Speaker, can I join the congratulations uh, on your one-year anniversary? Turning now, if I may, to COVID-19, on the 21st of September, when the government's scientific advisers indicated that a circuit break would bring the virus back under control, the number of people that day who tragically lost their lives to COVID-19 was 11. The Prime Minister ignored that advice. On Monday, 42 days later, the number of people who tragically lost their lives to COVID-19 was 397. That's a staggering 35-fold increase. Does the Prime Minister understand the human cost of his delay in acting? Boris Johnson. Uh, well, Mr Speaker, in the answer to his uh, opening question, uh, of course, uh, we don't comment as a UK government on the democratic processes of our, of our friends and, uh, and allies, and I don't think, he would, I don't think in all seriousness he would expect uh, he would expect otherwise. But, Mr Speaker, turning to the, the point about, uh, about COVID and the decision, the difficult decision that this House has to, to face tonight, I think I speak for many honourable members uh, across this House when I say I don't think any government would want to impose these measures lightly, or any Parliament would want to impose these measures lightly on the people of this country. And it was always right, Mr Speaker, to pursue a local and a regional approach, as our scientific advisers said. And I'll tell you why, Mr Speaker, because that approach, that regional approach, actually was showing signs of working and still is showing signs of working. It did get the R down, the transmission rate down lower than it would otherwise have been, Mr Speaker. But we have to face the reality that in common with many other countries in this part of the world, we are now facing a surge in that virus, which this House must now tackle with the measures we've outlined. They will expire, as honourable members know, on December the 2nd. I hope very much the members opposite will support them tonight. Uh, well, quite a lot to unpack there. Let's just pause that, uh, Patrick McGuire. First of all, let's deal with the US election. Explain to people why Boris Johnson's taking this line that Britain doesn't comment on other people's elections. Well, I, it's um, obviously he has to work with either who, either man who who wins or or, or doesn't, as the case may be. And uh, it's it's not going to behove Boris Johnson to either dismiss Donald Trump or, more pertinently, uh, row him behind his old mate Donald 
when Joe Biden, uh, the, the, the mail-in ballots declare for Joe Biden later, especially given the sensitivities around uh, a post-Brexit trade deal. But obviously, Keir Starmer um, is attacking him on that because of the perception that he's close to Trump, uh, who is perhaps the only person more unpopular among British voters at the moment than the Prime Minister, right? There, there were a polling last week that said that Trump wouldn't win a single UK constituency. Although, uh, warning for Keir Starmer that he, his support is highest among the sort of few red wall seats that Labour uh, hold on to. So it's a, it's a tricky wicket. Yeah, the, 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 the culture war comes to the UK and that as well. On the question of the, uh, the lockdown, uh, Keir Starmer laying out lots of figures and pointing out that the death rate uh, going into this lockdown is higher than it was um, back in March. The Prime Minister, I thought it was notable, he was careful to say initially uh, that no government would want to do this and then correct himself and no parliament would want to do this. Basically, almost try to dip the hand of every talk, every MP in parliament in the, in this decision. Yeah, getting as much buy-in as possible. Um, also, I thought the striking thing there was his measured tone, um, which wasn't to say, as you say, there was no political opportunism in there. It was just better disguised. Usually he'd be leading with his chin if Keir Starmer was talking about documents from two months ago. He'd say, well, Captain Hindsight, rise to the rescue again. Obviously, he's now he's now Captain Hindsight, or you know, he has deferred to you know the Captain Hindsights of uh, his scientific advisors. So he can't do that. But as you say, he's trying to lay the groundwork so that the blame is shared equally. Among, uh, among the parties in Parliament. It's interesting, just before PMQs uh, started, the Press Association reporting that Peter Bone, one of the Tory MPs, uh, unhappy about these lockdown measures, has compared the government's arguments for a new lockdown in England to Tony Blair's so-called dodgy dossier on Iraqi weapons of mass destruction. He said he decided to vote against it after a briefing for MPs by government scientists. He said it seemed to me that we were being given figures that appeared to support the government's case, but actually didn't. And we weren't having other figures which would have let us make a more balanced judgment. So just more MPs coming out to criticise the government. Let's go back to the House of Commons. This is Keir Starmer. Mr Speaker, I'm sure nobody wants a lockdown, but it is a question of timing. Had the decision been taken a few weeks ago to put in place a circuit break, it could have been done for two to three weeks and taken advantage of schools being closed over half term. Now the Prime Minister's proposed lockdown will be for at least four weeks. That means businesses will be closed for longer and in the critical run-up to Christmas. Does the Prime Minister understand the economic cost of his delay in acting? Mr Speaker, and it's precisely because we understand uh, the economic cost, and it's precisely because we understand the social, the psychological damage of lockdowns, that it was right, Mr Speaker, to go uh, for the local and the regional solution uh, that was supported uh, by, and indeed supported by many, uh, by many members, indeed I think by the right honourable gentleman, uh, as long as it was uh, uh, useful to him uh, for, for a while. That was, the, that was the right approach, but what I can tell him uh, Mr. Speaker, is that at the uh, expiry of this period on December the 2nd, by then, as I said in answer to my honourable friend earlier on, we will be rolling out across this country uh, new types of testing on a scale never seen before, uh, beginning uh, this week, as uh, I've said, in, in Liverpool, enabling us to detect asymptomatic uh, cases, Mr. Speaker, and that's crucial because 70% of the transmission is, is taking place, as the House knows, between people uh, who have no symptoms. Uh, and that will enable us to find new ways uh, on uh, at a mass scale to break the chains of transmission. I want to thank particularly the uh, Labour leadership of Liverpool for their cooperation, uh, a, a manner of cooperation that uh, I commend to the benches opposite. Yes, sir. Uh, so the, Keir Starmer's argument is basically my lockdown was nicer than yours. It was only three weeks, not the four weeks that Boris Johnson's gone for. Um, uh, and but then Boris Johnson makes a point, well, I, I know about the economic cost, that's why I didn't want to do it. Two quite shrewd bits of politics there. The first was Keir Starmer leading on economic costs. Now, what does any good leader of the opposition do? They exploit the pain points for, for part, the party of government that they're opposing. What is the uh, animating concern of Tory backbenchers? It's the economy. That's how they're framing. Um, that's how they're framing their disagreement with this. Indeed, that's how much of the cabinet is framing their disagreement with this. So that's very shrewd of Keir Starmer. And also, it allows him to deflect the criticism that actually he uh, cares little for the economy and he's just 
you know, missed a lockdown. The second thing from Boris Johnson was very interesting. It's a tactic he's used before. It's effectively, um, it's the equivalent of Margaret Thatcher at some point in 1983 um, going up to Liverpool and uh, being pitched having a pint with Derek Hatton or, you know, going newt spotting with Ken Livingston. It's getting uh, local government leaders, uh, especially local government leaders from the Labour Party, just as he was doing with the other parties in Parliament, casting them as the authors of the strategy as much as him. And that's the double-edged sword for mayors like Andy Burnham, Steve Rotherham, Joe Anderson. They've been more visible than ever before in this crisis, but the government hopes that they'll be able to devolve blame and responsibility as much as power. Really interesting. No, both sides have still got gloves very much on because they're, they're sort of slightly dancing around each other. Keir Starmer can't really criticise the Prime Minister for doing the thing that he asked for. Boris Johnson can't criticise Keir Starmer because he, need, he may well need his votes uh, later on in the Commons. Let's go back and hear from the Labour leader. Mr Speaker, the Prime Minister's delay in acting is a huge failure of leadership and it's no good saying that there was support for the tier system. As he well knows, I looked at the evidence and made a decision three weeks ago that the right thing was for a circuit break. And I don't buy the argument, I don't think anybody does, that the facts suddenly changed this weekend. The direction of travel and the number of infections, hospital admissions and tragically deaths have been clear for weeks. But we are where we are. Millions of people across the country are really concerned about the restrictions that will come into force at midnight tonight. And I accept that we've all got a duty to pull together and to try to make this lockdown work. So I just want to ask some basic and direct questions on behalf of those millions of people. First, will the lockdown end on the 2nd of December, come what may, or will it depend on the circumstances at the time? People need to know that. Well, Mr. I'm not sure we're getting very much further with Keir Starmer on this round of questioning, are we? Uh, not particularly, although, again, exit strategy, big preoccupation of... Tory MPs. That was the big ask that the Northern Research Group of Tory MPs uh, demanded of Boris Johnson in their letter to him last week um, that made a lot of waves. And also it's what Keir Starmer, um, to, a, to a lot of raised eyebrows in Westminster, was asking for in sort of April, May, when the first lockdown was sort of still fairly novel. He was saying, what's your exit strategy? Again, he knows that's a uh, you know, a concern of business and Tory backbenchers, and um, it's quite true politics. Yeah, the, the single most damaging uh, word for Boris Johnson this week was when Michael Gove was asked, could this lockdown be extended beyond December the 2nd? And he told, I think, Sophie Ridge on Sky News, yes. Yeah, exactly. And Keir Starmer knows that any answer Boris Johnson gives now is unlikely, one, to be categorical, and two, it's likely to be undermined by Michael Gove or Rishi Sunak in either direction when they're next interviewed. <laughs> OK, let's see how the Boris Johnson uh, responds to that. Uh, I'm, I'm grateful for the, for the support that he's now uh, offering and I can uh, answer him very simply. As the House knows and as I informed him repeatedly on Monday, the, uh, the, these measures, these autumn measures to combat the surge will expire automatically, Mr Speaker, on December the 2nd and we will then, I hope, very much uh, be able to get this country going again to get businesses, to get shops open again in the run-up to Christmas. But that depends on us all doing our bit now to make sure that we get the R done. I've no doubt that we can uh, and, that we, and that we'll be able to go forward from December the 2nd uh, with a very, very different uh, approach. But, of course, it will be up to the House of Commons to decide thereafter what to do. So that's not particularly categorical. We did describe them as autumn measures, and I think probably once we do into December the 2nd, they probably do start becoming winter measures. Uh, he said they will automatically expire on the 7th of the 2nd. We will then, I hope, very much be able to get this country going again. And again, saying it's actually it's just down to Parliament. I'm merely just the, the servant of Parliament on this. And if, if Parliament, on my instruction, whipping uh, hundreds of Tory MPs, end up voting to extend it, well, that's just what Parliament's chosen to do. Yeah, or if, uh, you know... Dozens of Tory MPs rebelled and I pass it with Labour votes. I mean, he's almost in the situation that Theresa May was in on Brexit, right? There was a plausible majority for her deal, um, you know, at three times of asking, but it always ran through somebody else's votes. Now, if you think the internal politics of the Conservative Party are uh, rancorous and uh, un, un, uh, uneasy now, wait till December the 2nd um, when uh, Boris Johnson reluctantly, an ashen face, stands at the dispatch box saying, just two more weeks, guys, um, dozens of Tory MPs rebel and, and they pass with Labour votes. Then, um, then, you know, as much as he's saying now it's all for Parliament to decide, 
um, that that is a rod for his own back. Yeah, I tweeted uh, Giddley watching uh, Strictly Come Dancing while I was bombarded by messages from Tory MPs and ministers at the weekend. I think I tweeted saying that uh, a, a prediction Keir Starmer will be calling for talks with Boris Johnson this week. What you're saying, that sounds like that's more likely to be in the week in the run up to uh, December the 2nd. Because if, if Keir Starmer starts going wobbly on lifting restrictions... Uh, and it, Boris Johnson's got a rebellion on his hands, and things could be um, less, uh, could be pretty difficult. Let's go back to Keir Starmer in the House of Commons. Mr Speaker, I accept there will be a vote in the House. That doesn't tell us anything. That's the process. But I want to press the Prime Minister. Is he saying that if by the 2nd of, of December the R rate, the infection rate, has not come below 1, and therefore on the 2nd of, uh, of December the infection rate is still rising, still rising on the 2nd of December... Is he saying that come what may, we will come out of lockdown with infection rates going up on the 2nd of December? That doesn't seem sensible to me. Mr Speaker, Mr. Speaker it is just to jump in on, on that, I'm slightly confused sometimes about Keir Starmer's strategy. A minute ago, he was complaining that it was four weeks and not three and the economic impact of that. And now he's calling for the Prime Minister to give a promise that it will keep us in lockdown if, that's the, you know, if the infection rate is uh, rising. I know technically they are, but it is possible to think those both those things. But somebody who's only just you know passing uh, with a passing interest in this might think, does he want us in a lockdown or not? Well, you know, as leader of the opposition, he might say his is not to reason why. <laughs> you know, it's this is the this is classic Keir Starmer. It's um, you know, some people on the left of the Labour Party say it's weather vane politics. Other people say it's uh, you know, good holding the government to account whatever decision they take. Well, let's go back and see if uh, Boris Johnson feels held to account by that. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, it is thanks to the efforts of the British people uh, that the R is now currently uh, only just above one as it, as it is. Uh, and uh, we are doing the right and the prudent thing at the right time uh, to get that infection rate down. And these measures, as I've said repeatedly to the House, Mr. Speaker, will expire on the 2nd of December. If he's now saying he wants to expand, the, uh, protract them beyond uh, the 2nd of December, then perhaps he should make his position clear. All right, Keir Starmer again. Keir Starmer. I just want some basic honesty, it, and this is serious. If the infection rate, if the infection rate, we've got to look the public in the eye. If the infection rate is still going up on the 2nd of December, it is madness to come out of the system back to the tiered system when we know the one thing the tiered system can't cope with is an R rate above one. That's the basic point. We can come back to it on the 2nd of December, as we always do, Mr Speaker, but that's the point I'm making. The one thing we know a circuit break or lockdown does do is to buy time. And the Prime Minister needs to use that time to fix, test and trace. And I know he'll talk about the capacity of 500,000, what's going on in Liverpool, is world beating, etc. But we've been going round and round in circles on this. Mr Speaker, the latest figures show that 113,000 contacts were not even reached, and that's just in one week. Only 20% of those who should be isolating are doing so. And the majority of people still don't get results in 24 hours. So can the Prime Minister give a straight answer? What's he going to do in the next four weeks to fix this? Because if he doesn't, we'll be back here again. I suspect we're going to hear just Boris Johnson's greatest hits on coronavirus. That wasn't the most taxing of questions, I suspect. Let's see what the Prime Minister has to say. Mr Speaker, um, I, with greatest respect to the Right Honourable Gentleman uh, who has uh, stood up uh, and said uh, that I will brag uh, about NHS test and trace and their achievement of 500,000, uh, a target of capacity of 500,000. You know, I think uh, uh, I, I'm perfectly willing to accept the failings of NHS test and trace. Of course I am. Uh, and, and of course I take full responsibility for the frustrations people have experienced with that system. But to go from 3,000 tests a day, 2,000 tests a day, to 500,000 is a quite remarkable feat. It's the biggest diagnostics exercise this country has ever carried out. And, Mr Speaker, they are, they are helping to drive down the R. Uh, and it is, and it is, they are doing, in my view, an absolutely invaluable job, whatever the difficulties they face. What we now need to do is to come together as a nation, briefly if we can, to put aside party political wrangling and point scoring and work together, work, as I think he will tonight, uh, work together to support this package to get the R down and allow us to go forward in a different way with the mass testing that I've outlined from December the 2nd. Uh, Boris Johnson holding out a bit of an olive branch. So let's all work together, put aside our party political point scoring, uh, which I may have done against you in the past. Um, really interesting, Chris has just uh, got in touch and said, I don't understand Keir Starmer's line here, Mark Drakeford, who's the First Minister in Wales, has st said that Wales comes out of its lockdown uh, next week no matter what. 
And obviously, you know, Keir Stop, I mean, Keir Stop, he was saying, is also sort of, you know, at times at odds with uh, Labour mayors in various parts of Northern England as well. Yeah, he is, and that and that that is the, that is the tricky. That's the sort of double edged sword of devolution for for the Labour Party, particularly the Labour Party at Westminster. Right, it's the new Welsh NHS, um, which was always Theresa May's favourite riposte to Jeremy Corbyn when he went on <laughs> one of his um, one of his one of his monologues about the uh, the state of the health service. You could very easily say, well, hang on, you run the NHS in Wales, and uh, you're doing uh, you know an even worse job than uh, NHS England. So it's it's the politics of this are going to be very tricky for Keir Starmer, especially because, given the um, the amount of publicity that circuit breaking in Wales has had, and also then what if uh, what if uh, infections going up in Wales in two weeks' time? It's 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 really tricky. Okay, let's go back to the last exchanges then, Keir Starmer. Keir Starmer, Mr. Speaker, the Prime Minister must see that if four out of ten of those that should be contacted are not being contacted, we've got a problem in the system that needs to be fixed in the next four weeks. Finally, I want to ask about care homes, which, of course, were hit so badly in the first wave of this pandemic. And can I pay tribute, Mr Speaker, to all those working in care homes who have given such dedication and commitment in the toughest of circumstances, and we owe it to them not to repeat the mistakes of the first wave. But, Prime Minister, as we face the second wave, there is an increasing concern about the emotional well-being of those in care homes and their families if all visits uh, are stopped. It must be possible to find a way perhaps a dedicated family member scheme of some sort to allow some safe visits to alleviate the huge fears of isolation and despair across the coming months. Will the Prime Minister work cross-party to find a scheme that will work for those in care and their families? Well, Mr Speaker, the new, new guidance on care homes and visiting uh, relatives safely, because the, the point he makes is in incredibly important, uh, is going to be uh, announced today to try to strike the right balance between people's uh, real, real need to uh, see their loved ones and obviously the risk of spreading the disease in care homes. We're going to be publishing uh, some guidance about how that can be done today. Uh, and I I'm, you know, I'm grateful to, to his offer to work uh, collaboratively, but I have to say, Mr Speaker, that the House will generally have noted that he has used this crisis uh, as an opportunity to make uh, political capital to have to have what I think a shadow a shadow a shadow spokesman called a good crisis a good crisis mr speaker well can I commend a different approach because he's attacked the government's uh, strategy uh, can I commend a different approach because the former uh, labor leader the right honorable former member for for Sedgefield uh, who is not as fashionable in, in, on those benches as he once Tony uh, was or, sh or, or should be has written a good or, not, 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 not with all of them, Mr. Speaker. That's on the front page, but not with all. He's written a good piece in today's Daily Mail, uh, Mr. Speaker, in which he supports, broadly supports this government's strategy, praising UK drugs companies for what they're, they're doing, supporting our search for a vaccine, and supporting mass testing in Liverpool, uh, which uh, he deprecates, Mr. Speaker. And uh, I think he, uh, he, what he should do is actually take a leaf out of uh, the Blair book. Uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, and by the way, and by the way, I can tell him uh, that Tony Blair would not have spent four years in the same shadow cabinet as Jeremy Corbyn, uh, standing shoulder to shoulder with him. Well, there we are. The, literally, in the last breath, Boris Johnson managed to raise Jeremy Corbyn, being a bit naughty. Actually, he's not. He should refer to him as the um, uh, uh, me member from the right honourable member for Islington North. Islington yeah. North, and not referring to him as Jeremy Corbyn. It makes a better social media clip, I suppose, if you name him like that. Um, uh, knowing that uh, Keir Starmer doesn't have a comeback, he, that's when he takes the gloves off. Says, uh, you know, does the whole, you know, party political uh, point scoring, you know, referring again, is it Kate Green is the shadow um, shadow education shadow secretary. Education yeah. secretary. He was caught saying that the Labour shouldn't give up a, a, a good crisis. Um, raising Tony Blair and saying that Keir Starmer should be more like Tony Blair, which would probably upset those who are already upset that, Ke that um, Jeremy Corbyn has been given the um, being suspended. What do you make of all of that? I mean, I suppose in the end it's going to be overshadowed by what's coming out of America and the actual act later on of voting to go into lockdown. Well, I'm not convinced of the, uh, of, the of a strategy that encourages Keir Starmer or you know that uh, suggests that Keir Starmer, uh, you know, that would be a really uncomfortable. Uh, line for for Jeremy Corbyn, for instance, right? Why don't you do what Tony Blair does? Because Jeremy Corbyn uh, is often looks physically uncomfortable when he you know talks or, talks about Tony Blair. Um, Keir Starmer, uh, not from the same wing of the Labour Party as Tony Blair, but is very much closer to Tony Blair than he is Jeremy Corbyn. So I'm not really convinced that that's the that's the you know the slam dunk uh, attack on uh, Keir Starmer that Boris Johnson thinks it is. To be honest. 
Uh, well, you're listening to PMQ's Unpacked uh, with me, Matt Chorley. I'm joined in the studio by Patrick Maguire. Let's take a listen to the uh, front bench exchange between Ian Blackford, the SNP Westminster leader, and Boris Johnson. Up in Scotland with Ian Blackford. Ian Blackford. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. And I'd like to take the opportunity to send my best wishes to our friends in the US during this anxious time. Donald Trump claimed an unsupported victory and major fraud with millions of legitimate ballots left to count. And I hope the Prime Minister will join me in condemning his actions this morning. Mr Speaker, on Monday, the Prime Minister agreed access to the furlough scheme at 80% for Scotland if lockdown restrictions require it. Subsequently, a number of his ministers have rolled back on that promise and the Scottish Government have not received any detail on what the commitment means in practice. Today is the Prime Minister's opportunity to clear up this mess of his own government's making. Will Scotland receive full 80% furlough and self-employed payments on current eligibility whenever it is requested by the Scottish Government in the months ahead? Well, I'm, Mr Speaker, I hesitate to accuse the Right Honourable Gentleman of failing to listen to what I said on, on Monday, but I think he heard exactly uh, what I said. I gave a commitment then. I in no way budge uh, from that uh, commitment. Furlough is a UK-wide scheme. Uh, it's helped save, I think, about 10 million jobs uh, in this country, including uh, about a million in Scotland, Mr Speaker. Uh, well, there we are. So the, the, the SNP has really been trying to keep this row going, haven't they, about the 80% furlough, even though the government has moved on it? Yeah, it's interesting. In that question, you see the two prongs of the SNP, uh, the SNP campaign for independence, one of which is stronger than the other. The first is the, the cultural issue, the cultural contrast with, uh, with, with uh, Liberal Ni Nicola Sturgeon and populist Boris Johnson, as seen with the invitation for Boris Johnson to support Donald Trump, which he predictably rejected. The second which Scottish Tories, as pessimistic as they are at the moment, still feel a little bit of optimism on, feel the SNP haven't proven their case, is this idea that only the United Kingdom can give Scots the economic uh, protection, the economic strength uh, in the global economy that they need. Um, now, this 80% furlough row, uh, even though it's sort of been resolved, as you say, is a manner from heaven for the SNP because it allows them to say, look, all this nonsense that... Um, the uh, the uh, uh, Scotland and the United Kingdom can um, maintain its economic clout is rubbish because they won't even extend at a time of acute crisis um, the, the the treatment they're giving to people in England um, and whether but whether that will wash given that you know furlough has kept jobs afloat in Scotland and now it's being extended is another question. Uh, yeah, and but you know, like you said, the SNP's ability to turn it almost anything to their advantage is is always impressive and remarkable. Their their, their political um, nous is. It's to be applauded, whatever you think of uh, of, of uh, their aims. 